Church, uh, Dr. Uh, Sedaba. We will now proceed with the introduction of our uh, resource uh, speaker. Uh, Dr. Rina B. Opolensha is an Associate Professor of uh, Microbiology at the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, where she graduated with a BS degree in uh, biology. Um, she obtained her MS in microbiology from the University of Queensland, where she specialized on molecular pathology. Now, as an awardee of a Fulbright Philippine Agriculture Scholarship, she, um, she pursued her PhD in microbiology at the University of Illinois, where she worked on the physiological and genetic analysis of one carbon metabolism in an archaeon called Methanocercina acetivorans. Now, her research interests include uh, microbial diversity of extreme environments, uh, bioremediation, recombinant antibodies, uh, in addition to uh, multi-drug resistant pathogens and the genetic basis of multi-drug resistance. Now she mentors undergraduate and graduate students in microbiology and uh, molecular biology and she has published papers in various journals in microbiology including the Journal of Applied uh, Microbiology, Letters in Applied Microbiology, and the Journal of Bacteriology. She has helped institute uh, several graduate courses and has co-authored several laboratory manuals in microbiology and was also a former head of the Microbiology Division of the Institute of Biological Sciences. She is an awardee of the Philippine Talent Search for Young Scientists, given by the National Academy of Science and Technology, and a recipient of the 2019 Professor William L. Fernandez Award for Excellence in Teaching Microbiology. So to talk about Archaea, the third way of life, let us all welcome our webinar speaker, Dr. Rina B. Opolensha. Uh, Ma'am Rina, naka-mute po yata yung microphone ninyo. Yeah, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, hello everyone. Good morning. Good morning to my colleagues, particularly to my former students. I saw them in the attendance earlier. So I'm, I am truly excited to talk about the domain archaea after this seminar. I hope that you will have a better understanding of these other members of the microbial world. Here is my presentation. Uh, please listen to it and at the end of the presentation i am open to your questions thank you good morning everyone uh, first, I would like to thank the Microbiology Consortium of the Philippine Society for Microbiology Incorporated for this opportunity to share with all of you what I know about the domain archaea. The archaeal cells are perhaps the most ancient cells that exist on Earth as depicted by this comic strip. Under the microscope, they do look like the bacteria, as they are unicellular and can appear as cocos, rods, and even form clusters, as we see in some bacterial cells. However, as I go on with my talk, you will realize that the archaea are quite distinct from the bacteria. Archaea is a huge topic that I cannot cover in this single talk. In this talk, I will focus on the following. I will briefly describe the history of the discovery of the domain archaea, show you the expanding tree of the domain, discuss some of their importance, compare them against bacteria, discuss some of their metabolic strategies, and identify some research opportunities. Before the 1977, the archaea were unknown to us, or more accurately, they have been in existence but were hidden before us. 
This is a copy of the program of a symposium that I attended in 2007 as a PhD student at the University of Illinois to then celebrate the then 30th anniversary of the discovery of the domain Archaea. I got myself a Sulina shirt that I will treasure forever. The first member of the Archaea was described as early as in 1880s, but of course it was not referred to as Archaea then. Nephanogens were isolated in 1936. Even before 1970, Carl Woos was already studying evolution. In 1977, with George Fox, Woos published a paper revealing the presence of the third domain of life on top of domains bacteria and eukarya. In 1990, the domain archaea was formally proposed. The first complete genome of an archaeon was released in 1996, a methanogen named Methanocaldococcus yanashii. In 2008, the upper limit for life was seen at 122 degrees Celsius in a methanogen. Thereafter, several more genomes of archaea have been sequenced and deposited in public databases. In the early, in the late 1960 assignment, Carl Woos was investigating the evolution of life using the small subunit of the ribosomal RNA. His protocol involved digestion and 2D electrophoresis of the digested fragments. The generated fingerprint or sequences were then compared and analyzed using a computer program developed by George Fox. This is one of the fingerprints that they generated. Archaea were included in the analysis of those because Dr. Ralph Wolf of U of, U of I was then working on the biochemistry of the methanogens. He observed some unusual features in the methanogens that were not found in bacteria and believed that they could be distinct microorganisms. He supplied these cultures to Woos during his study. Now, Woos, or Wolf, I meant, was the mentor of Dr. Metcalf, who worked on the development of genetic techniques for the methanogens. Dr. Metcalf was my advisor when I pursued my PhD at the University of Illinois. So that is my very short and very weak connection to the discoverer of the domain archaea. Please forgive my indulgence. The groundbreaking paper of Woos and Fox was published in 1977 in PNAS. Remarkably, the paper contains a single table showing the association coefficients or similarities between the rRNA sequences of only 13 organisms. The table shows three distinct clusters of similar scores. One for the known eukaryotes, another for the known bacteria, and another distinct cluster for the methanogens. Based on these findings, the authors propose three lines of descent for all living organisms, namely bacteria, archaea bacteria, and the eukaryotes. These findings made headlines in the New York Times with the younger Woos on the cover. This is the University of Illinois commemorating the archaea that was discovered. The tree shows that the archaea, although prokaryotic, are more closely related to the eukarya than to the bacteria. However, phylogenomics says that there could be not three, but just two domains of life where the eukarya evolved from the archaea. 
However, let us debate on this some other day. The fact remains that archaea is a distinct domain, whatever tree of life you prefer. The earlier phylogenetic tree of archaea shows five phyla, namely the, eukary the eukaryota, which contains the methanogens, the nanoarchaeota, which contains some parasitic archaea, the core archaeota, the cren archaeota, which includes known thermophiles, and the tom archaeota that includes some mesophiles and nitrifiers. However, the advent of genomics has led to the discovery of several new taxa, expanding the tree of archaea. As of 2017, several new phyla, classes, orders, and family have been discovered. New superphyla have, have also been discovered, including Asgard, Tak, and Dipan. Many members of the domain archaea are extremophiles, but not all archaea are extremophiles and vice versa. Hyperthermophiles, psychophiles, Pisophiles, halophiles, acidophiles, and radiation-resistant species have all been found in the domain archaea. Several members of the domain archaea play important roles in various biogeochemical pathways, such as the sulfur, carbon, and nitrogen cycles. Some are major players. For example, the methanogens are the major players in the formation of methane from CO2. Several more uh, uh, archaea play an important role in the oxidation of hydrogen sulfide to sulfate, as well as the oxidation of ammonia to nitrate. Some groups of archaea have been associated with various parts of the human body, such as the nose, lungs, skin, and the GI tract. Examples include the methanogens, which are abundant in the nose and gut of the human body. Members of the phylum Thom archaeota are abundant on the skin, while the Wus archaeota are abundant in the lungs. However, there is no conclusive evidence to prove that pathogenic archaea exist. Under the microscope, some archaeal cells resemble the bacterial cells as they can be rod and coccus, but unusual shapes like branching cells and square cells have also been found among the domain archaea. Some unique cellular structures have also been found among archaea. One of these is the canula. The canula are hollow tubes that connect the cells of the archaeon pyrodictium. The canula is embedded in the periplasm of the cell but it is unclear whether it is used for the exchange of nutrients and genetic materials between cells or provide a means of attachment and anchoring. The hami are a new class of filamentous surface appendages from an uncultivated uriarchaeal coccus, living with bacteria in cold sulfurous marsh water. They attach on bacterial filaments and divide it into two regions, namely the central, the central part with a barb-like structure and the distal part or the hook region 
with the tripartite end. The flagellum of the bacteria and of the archaea, which is called archaealium, are quite distinct from each other. The filament of archaealium is much thinner. Uh, and for example, in halobacterium species, they swim at only 2 to 3 micrometers per second against E. coli cells that can swim as fast as 25 to 35 micrometers per second. The archaeolum is used for motility, adhesion, biofilm formation, and other symbiotic and environmental activities. The proteins making up the archaeolums uh, are found to have widespread and linked glycosylation. The interior of the archaeolum is similar to typhoid pilus and it lacks hollow interior. Therefore, the archaeolum subunits are predicted to assemble at the base. The flagellins, which are the uh, subunits making up the archaeolum exhibit no similarity to the bacterial flagellins. They also have signal peptides similar to the type 4 pilus. The cell walls of bacteria and archaea are also distinct from each other. While two major types of cell walls are found in bacteria, the gram-positive cell wall and the gram-negative cell wall, there are various types of cell walls found in the domain archaea. For example, in, sulf in sulfolobales, S layer functions as the cell wall. In others, it's an, it's an outer membrane. In methanosphera, a pseudomurane functions as the cell wall. In methanothermos, there are two layers, a layer of pseudomurane and S-layer. In methanospirillium, there is an S-layer and another sheath. In methanosorcina, there is a layer of methanochondroitin and another layer of S-layer. All bacterial peptidoglycan contain an acetylmuramic acid linked to an acetyl glucosamine by a beta-1 for glycosidic band, which is sensitive to lysozyme. In contrast, the archaeal pseudomurane contains an acetyl talose aminuronic acid linked to an acetyl glucosamine by a beta-1,3 glycosidic band, which is not sensitive to lysozyme. Now, I have some questions to the audience. Can we subject archaeal cells to gram staining? If no, why not? If yes, can we now use the gram staining result as a taxonomic marker in archaea? So this is something that we need to think about. The bacteria and archaea also differ in their cell membranes. The phospholipids of archaea are made up of branched isoprenoid chains, ether linked to glycerol. The phospholipids of bacterial cell membrane, on the other hand, are made up of fatty acids, ester linked to glycerol. In addition, bacteria and eukaryotes form lipid bilayer while some archaea form a lipid monolayer. Transcription in archaea is similar to the eukaryotes. The RNA polymerase A of archaea requires basal factors to recognize the promoter region. The basal factors include the Tata binding protein or TBP and the transcription factor B or TFB, which both have eukaryotic homologs. In contrast, the bacterial RNA polymerase requires a sigma factor to recognize the promoter region to initiate 
transcription. The RNA polymerase of archaea resembles the RNA polymerase II of the eukaryotes. While the bacterial RNA polymerase contains five subunits, the RNA polymerase of the archaea contains much more number of subunits, 13 of them, 11 of which have homologs of the eukaryotic RNA polymerase II. The core components and complexity of translation in archaea are eukaryotic in nature. The archaea also exhibit elaborate translation initiation process requiring at least five initiation factors which again have eukaryotic homologs. Now going to some information on microbial genetics in archaea. Various DNA transfer mechanisms have been observed in archaea, including those found in bacteria, such as transformation, transduction, and conjugation. In addition to this, in the order thermococcales, some cells release vesicles, okay, they release vesicles, that contain either chromosomal or plasmid DNA. These vesicles can then fuse with the recipient cells, transferring the DNA that they carry. In cell fusion, cells establish physical contact by creation of cytoplasmic bridges. This creation of contact forms heterodiploid cells. These heterodiploid cells contain two different chromosome types from the parents and all the plasmids combined. This heterodiploid cell will lead to either segregation of the chromosomes and plasmid into the original state or the parents or recombination events between the chromosomes that would create a hybrid of the parental strains. In addition, the plasmids can be exchanged or they can also be divided unequally. In cramped when cells aggregate, Chromosomal DNA can be transferred by crossing the recipient membrane through a channel. This will then be followed by incorporation of the chromosomal DNA into the genome of the recipient cell through homologous recombination. In the laboratory, several natural and artificial delivery systems have also been developed for the archaea. These are the use of uh, polyethylene glycol, electroporation method, the use of liposomes, chemical transformation using calcium chloride and heat shock, and the natural uh, DNA transfer methods like conjugation and transduction. Let me focus on the liposomes. Liposomes are spherical vesicles made up of phospholipids. They form a lipid bilayer. Liposomes can enclose DNA and they can fuse with the cell membrane of the recipient cell, releasing the DNA that they carry to the cytoplasm. We now proceed to the carbohydrate metabolism in archaea. Shout out to all my former students in MCD 120, microbial physiology. Some bacteria utilize the emden meyerhoff farnes pathway where glucose is phosphorylated to glucose 6-phosphate. It is then isomerized to fructose 6-phosphate 
and phosphorylated to form fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, a C6 carbon. The C6 carbon is then split into two C3 carbon compounds, namely the dihydroxyacetone phosphate and the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or more popularly known as PGALD. In the lower shunt of the pathway, PGALD or GOP is then phosphorylated to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate which is a high energy molecule that serves as a phosphoryl donor in the synthesis of ATP via the substrate level phosphorylation. 3PG is then converted to 2-phosphoglycerate, which is then oxidized to phosphoenol pyruvate. Phosphoenol pyruvate is a high energy molecule that donates its phosphate group to ADP to form ATP via, again, the substrate level phosphorylation. Pyruvate is another product of the reaction. In archaea, although catalyzing the same conversions, the enzymes in the EMP pathway versions differ remarkably. The pathway modifications occur mainly in the upper part of the archaeal pathways involving an ADP or PPI or ATP-dependent kinases, distinct from the classical enzymes in bacteria and eukarya. The most striking difference in archaeal pathways, particularly in hyperthermophiles, is the direct and irreversible oxidation of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to 3-phosphoglycerate. By passing these reactions in the classical EMP pathway to produce 3-phosphoglycerate, this is catalyzed by an enzyme which is NADP plus dependent glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase, GAPN, or mainly found in anaerobes by a ferredoxin-dependent glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate oxidoreductase, or GAPOR. Both enzymes omit the formation of 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate and the production of ATP via substrate level phosphorylation with considerable consequences for energetics. Now we proceed to the etner duderoff pathway. In the classical etner duderoff pathway found in bacteria, the glucose 6-phosphate is oxidized to 6-phosphogluconate which is then dehydrated to 2-keto-3-deoxy-6-phosphorgluconate or KDPG. KDPG is then split into pyruvate and glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate. Now GAP is further metabolized to produce pyruvate using the same reactions as in the classical EMP pathway. Archaea utilize the modified ethnar duderoff pathways. The non-phosphorylated ED pathway and the semi-phosphorylated ED pathway. In this modified versions, the following reactions do not occur. In the semi-phosphorylated ED pathway, glucose is directly oxidized to gluconate. Gluconate is then converted to 2-keto-3-deoxygluconate or KDG, which is then phosphorylated to KDPG 
which is then cleaved to the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and pyruvate. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate then enters the lower common shunt of the EMP pathway. Thus, the semi-phosphorylated ED pathway has the same ATP yield as the classical ED pathway in bacteria. In the non-phosphorylated ED variant, KDG is not phosphorylated but is directly cleaved into pyruvate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is then phosphorylated into 2-phosphoglycerate and further converted to a second molecule of pyruvate. Due to bypassing the phosphorylation le at the level of KDG and also subsequent GAP oxidation, and since GAP oxidation to glycerate is not coupled to ATP formation, the net ATP yield of the non-phosphorylated ED pathway branch is zero. Let us now focus on the methanogens as these were the organisms I worked on for my PhD. The methanogenic archaea are biological agents of methanogenesis. The production of methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas and a potential renewable energy source for heat, electricity, and transportation. The methanogenic archaea produce approximately 400 million met metric tons of methane annually. So this is a lot of energy. They are all obligate anaerobes. The methanosarcina species in particular are metabolically and physiologically the most versatile methanogens. They can produce methane from no less than nine substrates including hydrogen gas and carbon dioxide, acetate, and several C1 compounds such as the methyl amines, methyl sulfides, and methanol. The methanosarcinus species utilize four overlapping methanogenic pathways to produce methane. The CO2 reduction pathway involves the reduction of carbon dioxide to methane using hydrogen gas as the source of electron. The methyl reduction pathway also uses hydrogen gas as an electron donor but reduces methanol to methane after the transfer of the methyl group to the coenzyme M. In the methylotrophic pathway, the methanol, for example, is disproportionated into carbon dioxide and methane. The oxidation to carbon, man, uh, to carbon dioxide produces reductants that are then used to reduce one molecule of the methyl group to produce one molecule of methane. In the acetoclastic pathway, acetate is first activated into acetyl-CoA, and then acetyl-CoA is dismutated into carbonyl moiety and the methyl moiety. The carbonyl group is then oxidized to carbon dioxide, whereas the methyl group is then reduced to methane. In archaea that derive energy from hydrogen, such as the methanogens, 
electrons originating from hydrogen gas reduce the F420 and then the methanophenazine. The latter, through the cytochrome B type, reduces the heterodisulfide reductase with the extrusion of protons to the outside of the membrane. This extrusion of protons creates a membrane potential that can be used by ATPs to synthesize ATP. In bacteria, quinones and other cytochromes are used to shuttle the electrons from hydrogen gas, also producing a proton motor force used to make ATP by ATPs. Let us take a look at the ATPs of the archaea. The A1, A0 ATP synthase is present in archaea. The V1, VO ATPs is found in the eukarya. The F1, F0 ATP synthase is found in bacteria, mitochondria, and chloroplasts. The common feature of these ATPases is a structure made of two rotary motors, the one and the zero motors. Connected by a central stalk and one to three peripheral stalks. A major functional difference is that the predominant physiological function of A1A0 and F1, F0 is to synthesize ATP at, an, at the expense of an electrochemical ion gradient, whereas the V1, VO ATPs drives ion transport at the expense of ATP hydrolysis. To recap what we have discussed so far, we talk about the history of the discovery of the domain archaea, the expanding tree of the domain, their importance, comparison against bacteria, their metabolic strategies, such as glucose degradation pathways, methanogenesis, electron transport chain, and ATPs. Archaea offers a wide range of research opportunities such as revealing the diversity of the domain, particularly those in extreme environments, using molecular approaches such as metagenomics, single-cell single genomes, etc., and then determine the, the forces that drive such diversity. Another is to unravel novel metabolic pathways discover ecological significance, and understand the molecular basis of survival of the extremophilic archaea in harsh environments such as uh, the, ba the molecular basis at the level of DNA, RNA, and proteins. Another possible research opportunity is to demonstrate the underlying process of gene flow. And then for application purposes, explore industrial and biotechnical applications of the archaea. For example, novel, novel enzymes and other biomolecules of the thermophilic, acidophilic, halophilic archaea. And then another research is to investigate whether extraterrestrial life exists. This is the field we call astrobiology. You can then present your research in a conference exclusive for domain archaea. One of these is the archaea, ecology, metabolism, and molecular biology, such as this one that I was honored to participate in. The conference gave me the opportunity to meet and talk with several archaea experts. Many of the works that I cited in this talk are from the participants of this conference, such as Dr. Cybers, Dr. Jarell, Dr. Caviccioli, Dr. Whitman, Dr. Allers, 
of course, my supervisor, Dr. Metcalf, and Dr. Albers. The conference is held only every two years. This year, it will be held uh, at West Dover, Vermont, USA. With this, I would like to end my talk and I am now ready to accept questions from the audience. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Opolencia. So as discussed uh, for many decades, uh, archaea have been uh, somewhat misclassified as bacteria because of their uh, prokaryotic morphology. But fortunately, because of molecular phylogeny, we eventually showed that archaea, just like bacteria and um, eukarya, they form a fundamentally distinct domain of life. No? Uh, uh, with unique morphology and biochemistry that allows them to thrive in extreme or very aggressive environments that are not possible for bacteria and uh, eukarya. And because of this, because of their unique uh, adaptation, because of their diversity, many archaea are now being screened for uh, different applications in various industries. And as mentioned by Dr. Opolencia, there are many research opportunities that are available if you do intend to study the archaea.